This unit can be run on all different kinds of mixtures, anywhere between a methane number of 90, which is almost pure natural gas, and 35, which could be considered uh, pure propane. Any kinds of mixtures in there, whether you've got ethane, propane, butane, any kinds of uh, heavier BTU fluids in that gas, this unit can actually adjust to it with that mixer and continue running. So the two inch ball valve is for all your gaseous fuels, anywhere between 40 PSI and 300 PSI. And then next to that, you've got your liquid propane inlet. It's a 3 8 ball valve, and that'll be your, your liquid propane supplement. This valve is a lockout tagout as well. So if you do have clean natural gas that's already been processed, and you don't meet the 40 PSI minimum requirement for the frame, this reducer can be removed and clean natural gas can be piped in there as long as it's between five and 40 PSI. On top of the engine, we have the MotorTech ignition system, all MotorTech ignition coils, wires, and then up to the left, we've got the MotorTech mixer. And that mixer allows us to vary the air-fuel ratio depending on what kind of fuel the engine's running on. So as the composition of the gas in the well changes, that mixer is able to adapt to that to correct for different levels of energy in the fuel. So on all of the cylinders, we have individual cylinder knock sensing. If the unit does experience knock, those sensors will pick it up, and the MotorTech ignition will reduce timing to try to prevent that knock. If that timing reduction isn't able to take away the knock, then it will put the unit into a warning and if it's bad enough, a shutdown mode so you don't harm the engine. Fuel train brings the gas in through here into the first filter and that whips the, the gas around and any, anything that's entrained in the gas is gonna hit the sides of that filter and drop to the bottom. And then the gas gets pulled back up through the middle of the filter and onto the second stage of filtration. That one has an actual element in there, a coalescing filter, will you? And that one will take out mostly fine mists of any, any water or liquid or solid oils. Both of them are equipped with auto drains. The first stage of filtration's drain is powered by a 120 volt AC electronic unit. As it fills up, it'll open a valve with an electronic solenoid and uh, spit it out the drain, using the gas pressure to force it out. At some point, the filter will become what they call fully saturated. If it's in the red, that filter needs to be changed. As the bottom of the bowl of that filter fills up with liquids, the float valve will open, allowing gas pressure to push all that uh, residual liquid out the bottom of the, the filter and into the drain. So this regulator steps the high pressure fuel that was in the scrubbing system back down to 2 PSI uh, to go through the natural gas solenoids and actually enter the engine. It has a high pressure shutdown or shutoff switch. If it's over pressured with fuel, that will trip and completely cut off gas flow to the rest of the unit. So just on the bottom here, there's a manual reset. So if the unit is overpressured and it shuts off fuel, you need to reset that. And you'll know if it's done that by the gauge at the bottom of the fuel train. And at that point, you're supposed to be around two PSI. If there's a severe pressure, overpressure to the unit, this first knockdown regulator will blow any excess out down the the excess blow off tube and out the back and up top so that you're not blowing off that excess fuel inside the unit but rather outside atmosphere. This line feeds liquid propane. It's a 3 8 line that feeds into the vaporizers. <clears throat> These vaporizers are heated by warm coolant to keep that, uh, that vaporization rate up. Uh, once, that, once that's converted into fuel, or gaseous fuel, it then goes through the piping and up the tube 
into the turbos. These here are what will turn on if we get a low pressure. If you're in automatic mode and you get a low pressure situation. Uh, if you're running this unit in automatic mode and you get a bubble in the well gas or well gas is shut off completely and you do have backup liquid propane, the unit will seamlessly switch over to liquid propane uh, so it doesn't shut down any of the well's critical functions. And then a timer can also be set for how long it waits to see if that well, ga uh, well gas stabilizes. And you don't continually switch from LP to natural gas. So here you can see the oil reservoir, which has oil, the level of the oil reservoir, as well as <clears throat> the gauge next to it will will be able to tell you how much oil the engine is actually consuming. And since the other side of the engine, that polishing filter is pumping oil from the pan back into that reservoir through the micron filter, this will give you a somewhat idea of how the oil is doing as well. Throughout the entire 1500 hour cycle of the unit, that, that oil in the reservoir will start to change color. It won't be black like oil pan oil, but it will start to change. It'll start full and then you could go out there say every day and you can see how far down it goes. And if you know the capacity of the tank, you can, you can measure how much oil the engine is burning. So the Micron filter takes in oil pan oil from the oil pump. It polishes it with the Micron filter. On one line, it slowly sends it back into the oil pan. So it's continuously scrubbing that oil pan oil. On the other line, it goes into this pump here, and this pump sends polished oil back up to the reservoir at around 30 cc's every 30 seconds. So as that oil that's already been polished is pumped back up through this line into the reservoir, and that level in the pan drops, this line draws polished oil from the reservoir, and it feeds it back into the oil pan to ensure that the oil pan level is always correct. If this reservoir ever runs out of oil and that leveler sees that the oil pan is now running out of oil, it will shut the unit down and you'll never get into a low oil pressure scenario. This unit does draw air out from outside across the batteries to keep them cool. So that cover does a little bit more than just cover the batteries and the terminals. The battery switch is lockout tag out, so in the off position, the switch can be locked off, not have any battery flow. So here we have a gas detector attached to the near the top of the unit. Uh, if the nat if there's ever a natural gas leak in the engine somewhere, once it hits the 20% of the explosive limit of the natural gas, that sniffer will go off. It will not, it'll either shut down the unit or it will not allow the unit to start. Uh, word of caution that most of the times there's so much airflow in the unit that you'll never be able to accumulate that much gas in the unit to set off these sniffers. The main goal is to not be able to start the unit while the co compartment is full of flammable gas. There's also one down on the frame for LP. So the one on top. Uh, since natural gas is lighter than air, should be set to natural gas. The one on the bottom, since LP is heavier than air, should be set to LP. This unit doesn't use a standard Generac coolant. This, this unit uses a nitrite free extended life coolant by Xerox. It allows us to get a lot more hours out of it before the coolant degrades and doesn't work nearly as well. So here's the air discharge area, the engine fan at this point has blown the air across the cooling package and drawn as much heat as it can out of both the coolant and the, the uh, fuel charge. Uh, it then comes into this area and then goes straight up uh, past the mufflers and uh, out, of, out of the unit. If the fan is in reverse mode in super cold weather, uh, this can get plugged up and this door gives you some access to that, that cooling package as well as the mufflers if the mufflers need any servicing. So all of our exhaust components are held on with V-band clamps. We don't do the, the typical slip fit on our exhaust. 
because that wears out and can't ever be reused. Instead, our, our flex, if it ever needs to be changed, has these flanges as well as our catalysts. The first screen is your main powering screen. You get to see power, frequency, voltage, all the main things, main functions of the generator. The next screen is one of the most important screens. This is your fuel selection screen. If you're on a site that has a different type of fuel that's not regular natural gas, here's where you come in before startup and you select your fuel, be it natural gas or LP, or anything in between natural gas and gaseous vapor LP. If you select one of these gaseous as well as the liquid propane, then it'll be in automatic mode and the unit will use whichever fuel is available to it. Um, over here you have your start, stop, your fault, and your alarm reset buttons. And then over on the right, you've got your navigation buttons, your menu, enter, and your selection buttons. Here we have our synchronization screen. When you're trying to parallel to another gen, this will show the different phase angle as it's trying to dial in on the rest of the bus. Once it gets to a good enough angle where it can sync to all the other units, the breaker will lock in and then you're good to go. Here's your statistics screen. You've got your run hours, how many times you've started, service time left on the unit, things like that. And then here you've got a couple different sensor screens. You'll see things like oil pressure, water temperature, intake temperature, battery voltage, oxygen sensor, mixer position. And after that, then you get to your NOx screen. On this screen here, you see all the individual NOx sensors in real time as the engine is sensing them. If they get about above this 32% NOx level, you'll get a warning. If they get above a 95% NOx level, then you'll have a shutdown. This next screen here, is your ignition voltage screen. So you'll see all the different ignition voltages per cylinder throughout the engine. And then this other screen here is another ignition screen. You've got ignition timing. You also have your firing order as well as orientation of the engine, which cylinder is which. This component controls mixer motor functions. The component right below it controls binary inputs and some outputs as well as a few analog outputs. Right next to that is the detonation controller. This takes in all the NOx sensor signals and sends it out to the controller. Below that you have analog inputs from whether it's coolant, oxygen sensor, sometimes sensors. Next to that, you have your throttle control. This will take care of any engine speed governing. And then shielded in this box down here is the base box, the actual brain of the unit. That's the MotorTech AIO NTC black box, or BB. And then you also have an, uh, an IG AVRI and an IG AVRI transformer for voltage sensing considerations behind there. That's segregated, so uh, to get rid of uh, high voltage, low voltage concerns. And then this component takes in our CAN signal for load sharing, and this is what outputs that analog signal for third party controller paralleling and load sharing. So the six colored wires on the far right are gonna be your standard CAN connection uh, between any COMAP or similar MGG450 units. And then the three colored wires to the far left would be for if you're doing any analog load sharing with a third party controller, such as Deep Sea or, or Dife. And then the two black wires to the far, far left of the uh, terminal block, that, those are for a remote start connection.